Uh, thank you, Mr. Fan, for thank finding you. time in your busy schedule. Uh, just let's start from the purpose of your trip. Why are you in Tbilisi? I'm here in Tbilisi uh, at the invitation of the New Economic Center, and I'm part of a traveling group of economists and experts and journalists uh, run by the Austrian Center, which is based in Vienna, and we are doing 30 European cities. I'm not doing all of them, of course, just a few, and they are visiting each of these 30 European cities in the run-up before the European Parliament elections. Mm -hmm. Obviously, EU is a very interesting time right now, and we are discussing economics. We are discussing what works in economics, what has been proven to work and not work, and also how economics can be made of interest to the average family. Because as we know, we've had a recession in Europe for six years, people's incomes have stagnated and people are asking questions, why can't we become more prosperous? Why can't we return to economic growth? And we are trying as a group to provide answers to those questions. Thank you. Uh, well, let's move to the most I will go back to economy very soon, but let's discuss now international situation, especially like... And I just came from Kiev. You, I was reporting in Kiev. I interviewed the prime minister there yesterday. Oh, so this is where I'm heading now. Well, in one of your articles, you have quoted Indiana governor Mike Pence saying, history shows the Russian bear's ambition will never die. They just go into a hibernation. What is Putin's ambition? Russian bear's ambition. What, is, uh, what does he want? What do you think? When I interviewed the Prime Minister yesterday, he was very clear. He said the biggest mistake the West has made in the attitudes towards Russia the last few years are they did not listen carefully to Vladimir Putin's speeches and take him seriously. It was in 2005 in Munich, many years ago, when Putin gave the famous speech saying the biggest geopolitical disaster of the 20th century was the collapse of the Soviet Union. Now, this is an astonishing statement. The Soviet Union was a brutal dictatorship. Millions of people were killed. And we were lucky that it collapsed without firing a shot. And Putin now has nostalgia for the Soviet Union because he is a Russian nationalist and because, frankly, he's an authoritarian. So he admires the central control. There's a famous story. A friend of Vladimir Putin's comes to visit him after he becomes president in 2000. And he says, uh, Vladimir, it's astonishing. You have moved out of the big ornate office of Boris Yeltsin, and you've moved to this small satellite office, which is much less impressive. And Putin tells him, well, yes, but this was the office used by Joseph Stalin. Small office, he tells his friend, but big power. Well, yeah, that's not the first time he praises Stalin. I mean, he's, it's his role model. I mean, he has revealed it like several times. Uh, well. How far the Russia can go? Do you expect Putin like invading, let's say, Latvia or Baltic state? Because uh, those countries, Eastern European countries, uh, fear, of course, like and are worried about Ukraine's invasion, but they are worried for their own security as well. Uh, President of Estonia asked NATO and like the United States to help them like, to reinforce their security recently. We hear the interviews from uh, Radek Sikorsky, like the, 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 the Polish uh, foreign, foreign minister. minister, foreign minister. So what do you think? How far he can go? The biggest mistake you can make is fighting the last war and not planning for the next war. Uh, the next war is not going to be like World War II. It will not be massive military armies crossing borders. It will be more sophisticated and, in some cases, more dangerous. I saw in Ukraine a war of intimidation, whereby if you mass troops on the border, you conduct military maneuvers, you hire armed thugs to cross the border and stage provocations and occupy buildings, you can destabilize Ukraine. They have elections on May 25th. Uh, parts of the country won't be able to vote. So if you delegitimize the election and say it was not a free and fair vote of all the Ukrainian people, that gives you more of a pretext for more pressure later on. It also means foreign investment will not come to Ukraine. They desperately need foreign investment, even though they've just gotten a $17 billion financial package from the International Monetary Fund. That's not enough. There has to be private investment. So the new model 
maybe closer to Finland in this Cold War. Finland retained its independence, but it was not independent in what it could do, what it could say about the old Soviet Union. It had to always ask permission to do certain things. This is the new form of conquest. You keep someone under your thumb, you don't actually put him in your pocket. Well, uh, 600 U.S. soldiers are now exercising in four countries, uh, Baltic countries and Poland. Well, this is a, obviously a symbolic gesture, 600 soldiers. Well, I can yeah. assure you that as long as the American soldiers are training in those countries, there will be no invasion. Uh, so this is the effect. It's more, it's, it's more symbolic, but it also means... This, is, this, is, this was yes. my question. So this, this is going to be the effect. There will be no invasion as long as... Well, you wouldn't... No. I mean, Putin would never invade a country that had American troops in it. Why do you think? What makes you think so? That would mean war. You think Americans Obama would... dying? Yes, that would mean war. So obviously the American troops are not based there permanently. They will leave. I'm simply saying, as long as they are there, there will not be any military. Well, conflict. can you evaluate financial sanctions? Like what some financial are thinking sanctions? against Russia. Like what you... financial sanctions are there? Well, whatever is there. Well, you tell me. <laughs> what are there? I don't see any. So this is your. This, this I is see sanctions against, you know, Putin's camp followers, his fellow travelers, his friends. You know, I think there are 15, 20 people who their assets are being examined in EU countries. Their travel bans. Uh, those are not sanctions. Those are irritants. In fact, the Russians are very amusing. You know, I, I must say the award for the most amusing propaganda of this last year has been the Russian reaction uh, to the West's outrage to, about Ukraine. Just yesterday, the deputy foreign minister of Russia announced, you know, these sanctions are very dangerous. They're very bad. This is a, this is a new iron curtain that is descending across Europe. You know, they are blocking people from trading and traveling. This is just like the iron curtain that the West put up in Europe in the 1940s, blocking the Soviet Union from access to high technology and to goods and services. This is completely Orwellian. Uh, this is, the Iron Curtain was put up by the Soviet Union, and they are, now they are saying there's a new Iron Curtain put up by the West. It's, 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 it would be funny if it were not so sad. Yeah, well, but Iron Curtain has its effect, you know, like it had its effect like uh, back then. Well, it's, and it's like very so, important symbolism, yeah. and they're trying to steal the symbolism and use it for their own purposes. Well, so you think that the sanctions that were so far like uh, adopted by the United States and uh, the EU are not going to affect in any way Putin's behavior? Well, I do think that Russia's behavior has hurt the Russian economy in the markets. Uh, we just have new numbers on the Russian economy growing only 0.1% perhaps this year. That's very slow. Yeah. But that's not because of sanctions. That's because investors are now looking at Russia with a little more of a standoffish approach. That's the result of when you have military conflict and the annexation of Crimea. So the West has not done much more than what the market's normal reaction would be. Well, uh, many say that financial sanctions alone, even if they are strong, um, are not going to be uh, sort of, are not going to work. Like, and they name well, an example. No, I disagree in, to some extent. I can give you a sanction that would send a very powerful signal and would be meaningful and would be completely understandable to almost anyone. After the Soviets occupied part of Georgia in 2008, after the French signed a contract with the Russians to build two helicopter carriers, Mistral yes. class, in France, um, large amounts of money. These are very modern helicopter carriers. The Russian generals have said, if we had these carriers at the time of the Georgian invasion, we would have had much easier time taking over more of Georgia. It would have enabled us to send commandos in by helicopter, and they could have occupied large parts of the country. Now, the French company building this is state-owned. It's not a private company, so there's no question of private property. The French have not yet said, we will not transfer these carriers. The first one is finished. It's ready to go. We, they have not said, we won't give these carriers to Russia. As far as I'm concerned, this is outrageous. If you can't even prevent high technology military weapons from being sold to Russia and delivered, then you're not serious about what's happened in Ukraine. Yeah, well, Mistral deal was a great disappointment to Georgians, I can add from my perspective. But it's been, well, it's been two months since Crimea was annexed. 
and the French continue to remain silent. This is no. unacceptable. Well, the irony is that, like, as you rightly mentioned, like the Mistral deal was done right after the Georgia-Russia war, while Russia was not like respecting and like implementing six point plan that was actually brokered by France. So that was the whole irony that we, we, <laughs> to be to be the best possible face on this, I think it sent mixed signals. Yes. Well, uh, but so you think that like just cutting the military cooperation and providing them with Misral like would work and not well, the financial at least sanctions? It, at least it would be something substantive and real, and it would be understandable to anyone who understands what Russia has done in Crimea. Look, if you can't cancel a military contract for sophisticated weaponry to a country that has just invaded another country, I mean, this is worse than Neville Chamberlain in 1938. Neville Chamberlain in 1938 did transfer or allow to transfer uh, the Sudetenland to Germany, but he never sold high-tech weapons to Nazi Germany after that. Well, uh, but on the other hand, like, Russia is not like North Korea. Like, Russian people, I mean, even, even the if middle you, class, If you they invade like a rebel. country, you know, people don't particularly uh, make distinctions as to what kind of invader you are. You're an invading country's sovereign borders. You're crossing international boundaries. You're in breaking international law. You know, trying to make a distinction as to what kind of authoritarian government a country is isn't the most important thing. You do not solve international problems by crossing borders using troops. Yeah, well, I didn't mean the level of authoritarianism. I meant the Russia is not a closed society. I mean, people travel each day. Middle, each day it becomes more closed. And you think that the fact that people will get disturbed in Russia with this, maybe with the sanctions, that oligarchs will be sanctioned, like, and their bank accounts may be frozen, and I don't know, like, Magnitsky Act, like, is widened, and, like, the scope of Magnitsky Act. Well, I don't Act, see any evidence not... it is being widened very much. Uh, 15 or 20 people is a very small number. Well, thank you. Uh, well, uh, the EU is frustrated with the U.S. Um, on not loosening the legislation on the export, like for uh, liquefied national ga uh, natural gas, while the U.S. is frustrated with the EU's reluctance to impose financial sanctions on Russia. Uh, so what is the way out of this situation? How can the EU and the, the United States can solve their frustration with each other? Maybe they can't. Uh, domestic politics obviously plays a big role here. We have an environmental lobby in the United States which has blocked the Keystone Pipeline from Canada to the U.S. They also have convinced the Obama administration to delay, to delay all of the permits for liquefied natural gas. So for the Obama administration to basically say no gas for you to Europe means they will continue to be dependent on Russian natural gas which gives them enormous leverage because if the Europeans react too far, as far as the Russians are concerned, the Russians can turn the screws on the gas, as they've done with Ukraine in the past, and that would hurt Europe's economy. Uh, the answer here is at least to convince the Russians you're serious. Even if you don't do everything you could do, you must convince them you're serious. The U.S. must say to Europe, we will try to export natural gas to you. If we started now, we could probably deliver the first shipments less than 18 months from now. That would be significant. We've already wasted two months in not doing that. Uh, the Europeans could say to their banks that hold enormous investments in the, in the Soviet Union, at least high-tech high -tech equipment and other things must be classified as potentially military technology or dual use and we're not going to allow that to be exported. It's only a small percentage of what the trade is between Europe and Russia, but that would convince the Russians you're serious. If the Russians don't believe the EU and the United States are serious, well, by not taking the invasion of Georgia seriously in 2008, it led directly to what is happening in Ukraine. If they, not, if they, are not taken, if they don't see a real response from the EU and the United States now, what's the next step? As the Prime Minister of Ukraine told me yesterday, God only knows what's, what's their plan C if the West doesn't react to this. Properly. Yeah, well, uh, so what you say is that ecological alarmism like, is playing its role in strengthening Russia. 
and environmental well, law. Well, the irony, of course, is that Russia is one of the worst environmental records of any energy producing country. They don't particularly spend time worrying about the environment very much. And if you cared about the environment, you'd look at the record of the liquefied natural gas industry. It's very safe. It can be made even safer. Uh, transferring it has a very good safety record. The Europeans have very high safety standards, as you know. Yeah, well, Germans issues. have refused to produce coal. Germans have, like, said but no. But natural to gas is a clean yeah. technology. Yes. And even in the shipment, it's relatively safe. So, if you're not willing to do that, uh, the Russians are just going to laugh at you and say you are not serious countries. Uh, well, thank you. Proponents of the free market economy uh, blame the Western economic policy and its like sort of orientation on the welfare state for its weakness in the face of Russia. I mean, welfare economies, what is make according to them, like welfare economies, what is making Europe weak because like. The defense spending is getting less and less every year, right before the situation. No uh, European situation. country meets the 2% yes. standard for defense that NATO has set. No European country does that. Yes, and even the United States, like defense budget has uh, come down to uh, prior to yes. World War II level. So do you think that like big state has a role uh, in what is happening now in the world? Like, Well, you have choices to make. Uh, I think that the biggest untold story in Europe, and to some extent the United States, is the older generation is putting the countries in debt, enormous obligations loaded on younger generations that will have to pay them in order to buy a higher standard of living for themselves and a better retirement, leaving young people with many fewer chances to build for their own retirement and to be able to pay to raise and educate their families. Uh, let me give you some numbers. In Italy, unemployment among young people aged 16 to 25 is now 28%. In Spain, it's 50%. In Greece, it's 70%. Many of these people look to a future that is just a brick wall. There's no way to go. I mean, in Portugal, 100,000 people in Portugal in the last five years have left the country, not to go to other U EU countries, not to go even to Brazil, which speaks Portuguese, but they, are, they have gone to Angola, the former Portuguese colony in Africa, a third world country, for economic opportunity. This is astonishing, first world people emigrating from Europe to go to the third world. This shows you the crisis in the welfare state. Obviously, everybody likes the benefits from the welfare state, but you have to pay for them. And if you don't pay for them, you're destroying the future of young people to be able to marry, have a family, and have a better life, and prosper. Yeah, well, as Margaret Thatcher have said, like the problem with socialism is that in the end you ran out of other people's money. Couldn't so, have said it yes. Well, in one of my interviews, like with Dr. Charles Krauthammer, I mean, he noted that uh, the power of the country is not the reflection of objective numbers. The power of the country is the objective strength multiplied by its willingness to use it. It's a fraction. Russians are fully willing to apply like their strengths. What is your take on his judgment? And do you think that uh, now with Russia like openly aggressing other countries, and we see that Georgia was not an isolated case, and Putin went on to Ukraine, and God knows where he's going to go next, will change like the attitude of the United States to apply its strengths whenever necessary? Well, two points. One is, I think Putin has already decided the Obama administration will not stop him, so he doesn't have to worry about that. Uh, secondly, uh, we have a problem in the international community right now. We don't have a set of tools to punish people who violate international law, including invading other countries, that are more than sanctions, and less than military force. And obviously we do not want to go back to uh, a military shooting war in 2014, 100 years after the First World War almost destroyed Europe and destroyed much of the progressive and liberal and fine traditions of Europe. And the First World War, as we know, led to the Second World War, and that led to the Cold War. We don't want to have a shooting war. 
But the challenge is how in the world can we mobilize parts of the international community to make Russia a pariah state, to make it outside the family of nations. I think we had a chance at the United Nations Security Council because no one voted with Russia. China abstained. Yeah. Uh, you have even Russia's neighbors, Kazakhstan and Belarus, being very nervous because after all, if you can cross Ukrainian borders, you can cross Kazakh borders where there are Russians living, you can cross Belarusian borders where Russians are living. So we had a chance. I don't think we have used that chance. So was I, don't know, I don't know what all the answers are. What was but, the chance, excluding Russia from the Security Council? Well, we, we certainly, well, for, I, don't know if you, I don't know how legally the process of doing that, but I would say this. We did kick them out of the G8, but I think we should have been much more public about it. I think we should move to kick them out of the International Trading Organization, or at least investigate whether or not they should be kicked out. I also think that the International Criminal Court at The Hague, what does it exist for if it doesn't exist to hear cases of a bunch of thugs like the Russian provocateurs in Ukraine right now crossing a border and interfering in the internal affairs of another country? I mean, we have in telephone intercepts from Ukrainian intelligence, I learned this yesterday, of Russian bosses in Moscow telling their agents in Ukraine who work for Russia where to go, what to do, and what to disrupt. This is criminal activity. Uh, it would not be tolerated by any nation. Uh, if the International Criminal Court exists for any reason, it shouldn't just be hearing cases against small African dictators. Uh, it should be hearing cases about real problems in Europe and preventing another uh, case of aggression against another European country. Well, uh, we are here, we are discussing like what should the US administration do in order to prevent Russia from doing what, he, what they are doing. But on the other hand, like the president of the United States is uh, doing what American people want. Because, How do you say I mean, that? Well, because he, uh, he, uh, the, the president is elected by the people and... What does uh, that mean? Uh, well, no, no, yeah. <laughs> look, presidents are elected as temporary custodians of political authority and force. Uh, we respect that they have been given the right to make decisions on our behalf. That doesn't mean the American people agree with them. You know, the, the president forced through a health care plan in the United States. It has 35% in the polls. People, its support is collapsing. The American people do not agree with the president on health care. They don't agree with him on a whole range of issues. His popularity is now lower than it has ever been as president. So just because a democratic leader in a free country makes a decision doesn't mean the people automatically agree with them. It means they have entrusted him with making decisions even if they disagree with him. But don't presume the American people agree with what their leaders do. They do, they do make decisions only every four years as to who should lead them. But they often will tell people who ask the public opinion surveys, no, we do not agree with what the president is doing. So what does the American people want the American president to do like, with Well, they don't want Russia. to go to war. They certainly do not want to go to war. Uh, the American people are not primarily focused on foreign policy. They're focused on their own internal policy. But I don't think they would be opposed to a president saying, you know, we should investigate whether Russia, well, first of all, should Russia ever hold another Olympics? I mean, we all know that much of the money at the Olympics was stolen uh, in the Sochi Games. Should the Russians be a member of the International Trade Committee, Committee Commission? I don't think that the American people would oppose taking steps to investigate whether Russia should belong to international bodies if it breaks international law by crossing borders, not just in Ukraine, but in previously in Georgia. Well, uh, talking about EU-US uh, relations, like what is the future of North Atlantic cooperation? Like, well, uh, NATO was in crisis since the Cold War. Well, many people have said that because like, it lost Russia as an enemy. It didn't have an enemy. Oh, now, I, well, they, yeah. they just wait a while. They yes, that, might come back. Uh, yeah, so uh, this is what happened now. Do you think it's going to revive North Atlantic uh, I Treaty don't know. Organization? I don't know. I do know that NATO is only as powerful as its perception of its strength. And if you have military spending at such low levels and, and, a, caveats, complete, yeah. and a complete refusal to use it, I mean, it's interesting. Many NATO countries will now send military personnel to a mission, but only if it's humanitarian. Yeah. Well, that is fine, but it doesn't help you in a case when international law is being broken. And it also worries me that the few things they do, I mean, six military observers from the European cooperation in Europe 
Commission are hostages in Ukraine. Yeah. And as far as I can tell, I don't think the complaints have been very loud or sufficiently loud. I mean, they're being held effectively by Russia or people who report to people in Russia. And I think complaints should be made immediately with Moscow. You are holding six hostages. We want them released. And while I'm getting to an end of our discussion, what about Georgia? I mean, how the West can protect like little tiny Georgia, like that is not like in the center of Europe, like Ukraine, and it's not as huge as Ukraine. I mean, what should be done? I mean, there is this NATO summit coming in September in Wales. Uh, so do you think like sort of uh, granting Georgia a membership action plan like could somehow save do you believe that will happen? Well, after like the recent visit of uh, French and German foreign ministers, like uh, no, I don't think that that will happen um, because well, they're hinting uh, they're hinting that okay, granting Georgia map like may irritate Russia even more and like they may not be safe to. I think you just answered your own question. Well, I do that sometimes. Well, you should, well, you're right. Look, Georgia is not going to be invited to join NATO. That's yeah. clear. Um, you know, Moldova now has visa-free access to the Schengen region for travel. Uh, I think Georgia was at one point promised to, that it would happen at the same time as Moldova. Now Georgia is being told to wait another two years. I think that's unacceptable. Um, put not your faith in the European Union. The European Union does some things well. It opens up trade. It has the rule of law. It has anti-corruption measures. Those are things you can take from the European Union and you can learn from them. Do not believe the European Union is your benefactor, is your protector. You must stand on your own two feet. Even Georgia, with four and a half million people, has resources to convince the Russians that they don't want to try this again. Because I don't think Russia wants to own Georgia. I don't think it wants to own Ukraine. I think it wants to keep them under its, their thumb so they don't have any independent actions that Russia doesn't like. I think they want to dominate them as they dominated Finland. And at least that's not war, thankfully. Uh, I don't think there will be another Crimea. First of all, you know, all of these regions that Russia occupies are basically economic basket cases. Crimea is going to be a very expensive pill for them to pay for. I mean, it's, a, it's an economic disaster. If they took eastern Ukraine, it would be even more of an economic disaster. And I can assure you, uh, if the Russians tried to take over Georgia, they would inherit an economic ruin. I think people would stop working. I think there'd be massive strikes. I don't think you'd have an economy that Russia would like. And at least, at least the, what the Georgians must do is tell the Russians, we are going to increase our defense budget. We're going to train a militia. We're going to basically convince the West as much as possible that they will have to issue uh, an advanced list of sanctions that will be taken because this will not be the first time, this will be the third time that Russia has violated international law. Well, the irony is that when, like right after the Rose Revolution, when Mikhail Saakashvili came into power, he started to build Georgia military and uh, the government was increased like drastically the defense budget, the whole budget was increased because the revenue started to enter the budget and not in the pockets of Shevardnadze's corrupt officials. But, you know, like, and when the, budget, the defense budget was increased and like uh, Georgian government was buying like sort of weaponry and like, I don't know, like uniforms and so on and sure. so forth, like for Georgian army. I mean, uh, some people in the West were worried that, okay, Saakashvili is preparing for war. Like right now, I mean, like about three or four days ago, I was if reading- If you have four million people hmm. and your neighbor has 150 million, that's not preparing for war, that's defending yourself. Yeah, well, and it's uh, sort of uh, two or three days ago, like Polish, Foreign Minister like Sikorsky gave an interview to Washington Post and said that look, so, so to, uh, why you, the question was why Ukraine didn't defend like Crimea and like Sikorsky like pointed to the army. I mean, what Ukraine is just now paying for 20-year illusion that neutrality would work and like that's why they were not paying enough attention to their defense sector. That's certainly true. So your. Uh, opinion, your take on neutrality, because there are some in Georgia who are saying that, okay, neutrality might be a good choice like for Georgia. Do you think that this is even... Like Winston <laughs> Churchill had a comment on this in the 1930s. He said, if you're sitting next to a very, very dangerous adversary that has no sense of morality 
and has shown in the past its willingness to break international law, and we all know which country he was referring to. He said it's like the alligator. You know, the alligator keeps eating things near you, and you keep feeding the alligator, hoping that it will eat you last or will pass you by and go somewhere else. That's neutrality. Neutrality is not an option. Well, and my last question, Georgia's current government is trying, actually came like with the mandate to normalize relations with Russia. Uh, it's, and it's a good, that's a, a theoretically wonderful idea. It hasn't worked out well in practice, has it? Well, no. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Pleasure.